So today we will start now seriously talking about PNF. So just we had a review of uh, and introducing what is concept of phase and frequency locking. Again, we will talk today. And then we will start uh, with a preliminary phase detector XOR. This is just for uh, introduction. And then we will see how we can improve the performance. What are the problems with XOR? And then how a PLL work really, phase lock to work. So this is just a review of last lecture. So I just escape. Okay. So essentially what do we want to do is, the objective is we have a reference clock. This reference clock, first of all, cannot be very much. In fact, the, the frequency of this clock cannot be very high. Okay. Just simple question. Can I have a reference clock and then generate it on a chip and then just uh, distribute it across the chip and use it as a reference clock? Okay. So, you know, like for example, I can have a crystal and crystals actually have a very high Q. Therefore, I put a crystal of chip and then I generate a reference clock. So, then problem is solved, right? Because if I have a crystal, I can generate it of chip give it to a pin, distribute it across the chip. So why not to go with this? Why do I need phase locking? I think most of you know the reason, right? Yes or no? If I use a, okay, repeating a question. If I use a crystal, I generate a very well stabilized clock, which is possible. Because Q of crystal is very high. Use this reference clock, give it to a pin, distribute it across the chip. Done. Okay, so then you mean that I cannot generate a square wave by a crystal, right? Okay, that is correct point. Range of frequency, exactly. I cannot generate a very high frequency by crystal because crystal is a piezo matter. It's essentially, it works based on piezoelectric properties. And therefore, because I'm con in fact converting mechanical energy into electrical energy. And you know, mechanical systems are very slow. Essentially, the main benefit of mechanical systems is they are very perfect compared to electrical systems, but they are slow. That is the main reason. For example, recently in IDM this year, an inverter was demonstrated which was fully mechanical inverter using mains. It was actually like a relay, you know, on and off, a mechanical switch. It was showing a very nice leakage performance and ion upon ion off ratio, but its frequency is not very high. So you can have, in fact, emulate any mechanical system by electrical system or vice versa. And it's just a matter of speed, which makes them different. And of course, other things like, for example, size and other things. Okay. So that is the point. Now, if I want to have a high frequency, therefore, I need to somehow multiply frequency. Now, to have a frequency multiplier, that frequency multiplier should be very perfect, right? I cannot have skew in the... <coughs> Uh, for example, if frequency multiplier, suppose I want to multiply frequency by 10 times, that 10 should not become 9.9, .9. for example, 10.5. So 10 should be perfect. And the phase of my signal should not change, right, a lot. So therefore, first is I need a very nice and perfect frequency multiplier. The second thing is if size of the chip is large and if I distribute now a high frequency signal, then skew and jitter problems will come to the picture. Therefore, if I want, I have somehow stabilized my clock or whatever high frequency signal I want to distribute and of course a periodic signal. By the way, the whole issue in PLL is periodic signal. So I have the whole advantage of PLL in CMOS technology, at least for most of the SOC applications is it helps to reduce jitter, it helps to control phase of the clock and also it helps to control the frequency. That's a very interesting uh, 
uh, advantage that we get. We can control phase and frequency both. Therefore, whenever, therefore, it's very simple. Now, you can distribute a low frequency signal easily across a chip, right? So, you put a crystal, distribute it to different pins from uh, outside. Therefore, you have access to a reference clock everywhere. Now, you put a PLL or whatever module that ideally we want to implement, which multiplies this frequency by some very nice fixed number, and then therefore, locally, you are able to generate frequencies which are in sync with that uh, main frequency. Therefore, all of them are in sync with each other. There is no as such phase shift, or at least that phase shift is very small, too small to be important as compared to the conventional phase, and then the job is done. So this is the motivation why PLL is so important now. Okay, so now starting from a simple XOR. So first of all, to make a loop, what we want to do, we want to make a feedback loop. Feedback loop receives a reference frequency, okay? Therefore, here we don't care about amplitude. Doesn't matter. We have a periodic signal. It has a frequency. So, loop receives a frequency. Then, this loop has a feedback. Okay? This frequency is integrated. Therefore, we will have phase information. Feedback path will give information about the phase of signal, which is available from system. These two phases are compared at the input of the loop, and then accordingly loop will adjust this phase. This is the thing which is done in any feedback system. Here, variable is not voltage, variable is frequency. That is the difference. Now, how an XOR can be used as a simple phase detector? So, suppose you have two signals, V1 and V2, two square waves with same amplitude, okay? And... Uh, doesn't matter what is the amplitude, but comparing to one reference voltage, for example, VDD. Now, if you look at the output, if these two voltage have some phase shift with respect to each other, which is shown by delta phi here, the duty cycle of output of XOR will change. Essentially, what XOR does, XOR looks, what is the phase shift between two signals, and according to that, phase shift, it generates the time information, which is the width of pulse. And that width of pulse will change average value of the signal at the output of XOR. So frequency is constant, nothing changes. What changes is the average value. Therefore, I would be able to convert phase shift into voltage. So how it does, XOR converts phase shift into time information. Then I get average value of this, therefore I'm converting time information into voltage information, right? And then I use this voltage information to control my phase or the signal. So this is a simple case. Now, for example, how this XOR behaves under different conditions. So, for example, I have a phase shift of almost zero. Therefore, as you see, except for some small delay, and because of that, we observe a very narrow pulses. Ideally, even we could observe zero, right? Therefore, there is no as such signal at the output of XOR. Now, if I have phi upon two phase shift, then you will see almost I have a symmetrical uh, square wave with the duty cycle of 50, uh, 50%. The reason is because this shift is 5 upon 2, right? It will be 1 upon 4. 1 upon 4 of the whole duty cycle, whole cycle. Therefore, I will get exactly 1 square here and 1 square here. Actually, if you notice, the frequency of output is twice of input. That also you notice. Therefore, we get a completely symmetrical 50% duty cycle. So, as I change from 0 phase shift, 0 radian, to pi upon 2 radian phase shift, then my average value changes. Okay? Now, again, I change from pi upon 2 to 3 pi upon 2. Now, changing from pi upon 2 to 3 pi upon 2, again, actually what happens is, I am repeating same thing. In fact, this is shown here. 
So what happens is this duty cycle, if you look at zero duty cycle, now, till now we were talking about one duty cycle. If you look at duty cycle of zero, now zero duty cycle will reduce. The same thing which was happening when I was going from zero to pi upon two. So this duty cycle will increase on, till the time I have exactly pi, okay. So then when I have pi, means that they have one anti degree phase shift with respect to each other. Means that none of them are simultaneously uh, complement of each other, right? Either both of them are one or both of them are zero. And that is the reason I get almost, ignoring our force delay at the edges, I will get almost the maximum DC that I can get because this is almost maximum duty cycle. And then from here onwards, Again, I am shifting, right? So as soon as you shift, therefore effective, if you look at the relative position of these two edges, okay, rising edge of, for example, these two pulses. Now again, relative phase shift will reduce effectively. Therefore, average value again will come back. So effectively, the characteristic of an XOR with respect to phase shift is in the form of a triangular wave. And then if you notice, if I want to look at the phase shift from, say, for example, this should be minus 2 pi. Minus 2 pi to 2 pi, I have four regions, right? The phase shift changes from minus 2 pi to plus 2 pi. It means that either, suppose if you get the input signal V1 as a reference, so V2 either is lagging or leading. If it is lagging, means that phase difference will be positive. If we have phase difference of V1, my phase of V1 minus phase of V2. And then if it is leading, phase difference will be negative. Therefore, the whole duration of phase change will be minus, will be 4 pi, right? So this whole duration is not, the performance of XOR is not monotonic. What does it mean? It means that essentially XOR has two regions of operation, if you look. First of all, for XOR, it doesn't matter whether it is lagging or leading, right? This is one thing. The second thing, if you look, the slope of this uh, plot is changing from positive to negative, right? If phase shift is between P and pi and 2 pi, or it is between 0 and pi. So now, suppose you have a feedback loop. You want to use this, right? So look at XOR, the slope, as an amplifier, okay, as we mentioned. You can look at it as an amplifier, differential phase amplifier. So gain is sometimes positive, sometimes it's negative. So what will be the first, first problem this will create in a feedback loop? You have an amplifier, its gain sometimes is positive, sometimes it's negative. Exactly. So stability will be a problem. If I design my loop for a positive gain, then I cannot operate it at negative gain, and vice versa. But then this is the point, right? Therefore, if I have phase lead, for example, it may work very well. If I have phase lag, it may not work. It seems. We don't know, right? This is our ex expectation. But the point is, actually, it may work. First of all, one thing interesting is about uh, this feedback loops that PLL has a lot of things, including a nonlinear behavior. And then when it has a nonlinear behavior, it's very difficult to model it. But there are, of course, models. But then we will show actually it will work. For example, okay, fine. So system is unstable. So what? After all, what we want? What we want finally this system to reach to some point. Right? I have an unstable system, but I want that unstable system to converge somewhere. Give you an example of an unstable system. Suppose you have a comparator with a feedback, okay? Regenerative feedback. You know, comparator with cross-coupled load. So this is a positive feedback, right? But we use it, right? Because positive feedback helps system quickly converges to a stable point. So why not to use this property here also? So what my feedback loop is unstable. But what will happen if I am here? Suppose I design in such a way, okay, my system is has negative feedback if I am here, between 0 and pi degree phase shift. Now, if I am between pi and 2 pi, so what will happen? System is unstable. What it will do? Either it will move in this direction or it will move in this direction. Means that it will enter into stable region. 
and now it will again behave like a normal uh, lead phase shift uh, phase difference system, right? So, therefore, we may think that okay, so it's not so important, but then we will see. Do from a stability point of view, it's okay, still loop will work. But there will be other problems which is related how um, PLL can lock. Okay, so now at least we know that this is the characteristic of XOR. It's able to detect phase difference. However, its performance is not monotonic. Therefore, it has, in fact, four regions of operation. And then according, and it doesn't care about who is lagging, who is leading, right? Okay, so what we call again for the case of uh, uh, XOR, if the peak value will be V0, which can be VDD for example, because maximum average will be almost VDD, maybe a little below VDD, divided by pi, which will be the gain of this. Means that if I uh, look at the slope of this line, slope of the, this line will be V0 upon pi. So this is average value, average value of this pulse, not the duty cycle. So this is average value, a slope will be V0 upon pi. Okay, so it is clear from here. So then gain of XOR will be V0 upon pi. And uh, as it's shown here, for example, if I have pi upon 2 and 3 pi upon 2, I will get same average. And if you look, waveforms are same at the output of XOR. It's just a matter of a phase shift. Because now output of XOR also has been shifted, right? And phase shift doesn't have any impact on the average value, right? If you change phase of a periodic signal, it doesn't change its average value. Therefore, the, the preliminary loop will be, I have a phase detector, I need a low pass filter to get the average of this phase difference, right? And then I need some module which will convert this voltage to a phase again, right? And converting voltage to a phase is easily done by a VCU. Do it converts voltage to frequency, but frequency is actually is phase. If you look at the omega t, Therefore, I can say output of this U can be omega, can be omega t, right? Both are correct. Therefore, I use a VCU and output of this U will have a phase which is changing with time, right? Input signal also will have a change with time, right? Suppose I have a periodic signal with frequency omega zero. Therefore, its phase is omega zero t. Its phase is changing linearly with time, right? Look at the real phase. So, it's omega zero t. Now, if my loop is locked, so this U also will generate omega zero. And then, suppose a static phase is zero in V1. So, V2 also will be omega zero t. Therefore, their phase difference is zero, right? Therefore, it's possible. So, it means that I have two linearly varying phase, phases and their difference is zero, for example. Okay. So, therefore, if I use... If I want to use a module here, really I can use VCO. There is no problem because actually when I have phase means frequency. These two are actually um, coupled to each other. I cannot say I have frequency, but I don't have any phase information and vice versa. Okay, but only the question is why I need to compare phases. Because for example, I can compare two frequencies also. Right? Uh, after all, signals are periodic. Therefore, I can have a module which compares frequencies. And then if these two frequencies are close to each other, then loop will lock, right? So that is also fine. Or it will lock if the difference between them is a constant value. Even here also, difference between these two phases can be a constant value. Means with respect to time, if it is constant, that's fine for me, right? So I have, I am able to make it constant at least preliminary, but we will see actually we need to make this static phase also close to zero in many applications. See, here you need to look what will happen if I have frequency, what will happen if I have phase. So that is a very important point to look, that's why we need to have phase detector. Definitely we need to have, we may have combination of both, but we cannot have only frequency detector. 
So to show this, just I do a simple calculation in uh, as per uh, control theory to show you what is the problem. Oh, by the way, I forgot about your question was why I have replaced this average, average of delta and j square, average of summation with summation of average. The point is, if I consider this delta and j's are independent, and their average value, of course, is zero, therefore, I can make this replacement. And then if I do it, then actually it will be sigma L square of it. Okay, so therefore, nothing changes. There, that's why I didn't put anything new on the model. It's same as before, only the reason why I had replaced, it is based on these assumptions. You have n random variables. They are independent of each other. Their average value is zero. Therefore, you can replace average of summation squares by summation of average of squares. This is very common and it is a well proven uh, thing. And it's not very difficult to prove it. Yet. Okay. In a statistic theory. Okay. So then uh, the goal which was uh, to show that if I increase area, then I will be improved. I will be able to improve mismatch performance. Uh, is valid, for example, by one example. Okay, now suppose what will happen, I will check for two cases, okay? I will make two loops. One loop will be first detector, one loop will be frequency detector. And then let's see what is the difference. First of all, it's good to know about the performance of a loop, okay? From system level point of view. What do we mean from this loop, okay? First case, you consider you have a frequency detector. And then I give the output of frequency detector to a low pass filter. Then I give output of low pass filter to VCO. And then I have a unity gain, unity feedback. So feedback factor is equal to one. Therefore, here I'm looking at frequency, okay? So this is a small signal model in frequency domain, okay? And this is feedback. This is F of S. So as any other linear system, this log loop also is a linear system, and then we can have an operating point. By the way, can you tell me, like, what? Give me an example of an operating point. Looking at x or coming. Uh, can you give an example of uh, operating point? Right. This is a system, and essentially it will be linear system if I can bias it around an operating. So what is an example of an operating point for an XOR in this characteristic? Okay. Therefore, where it should be here? Which delta T? At what delta T I can consider it's like a bias point for value? Five by two. Here. Right? Okay. So then suppose I, I have a loop which settles at a shift of pi f by 2 for a given frequency. Right? Now, if frequency is, if phase changes around this, therefore I have a positive gain, right? In both directions. Right? Therefore, what will happen is if I change, for example, my phase by delta value, right? At the input. So this means that. Now, I, this should move from this point to this point, right, on this line. With dynamics of PLN, look at it as a small signal model for PLN, right? So I have, this is my large signal model. I bias it at this point, And then now I apply a small phase change. For example, you apply a step input. A step input with delta phi equal to, for example, 2 degree, right? Or then output also will change by 2 degree will come here. Right? Practically, though this is theoretically is okay, but practically, usually we prefer to have zero phase shift. The reason is 
Because in many applications, you want to synchronize your data and cloud with each other. Therefore, I don't want to create this phase shift. I mean, in many digital systems specifically, it is better to have a zero phase shift almost. The reason is because you have an external clock frequency, right? That is your reference clock. And then you want to synchronize it with this. Therefore, if these two edges are exactly at the same, happening at the same time, you will have information, okay, where is your edge? Internal clock, which is a high frequency clock. Where is its edge? Therefore, it is better for clock and data synchronization. The second point is, if, if it settles on a constant delta P, then means that your error actually is very large, right? Between input frequency and input phase and output phase. This means your loop gain is a small. And for a feedback system, small load gain is not recommended because then it will be very sensitive to many non-idealities, including process variation, non-linearities. Therefore, it's better always to make it, at least even if, if you don't mind, even phase is not a problem for you, but at least with respect to sensitivity to variations, it's better always to make loop gain high. And when loop gain is high, you said effectively always you will be somewhere here. And then you change in any direction. And this direction, if it is a positive feedback, no as a matter. It will come back here and it will start from here. But anyway, yes. So therefore, essentially the concept is we are somewhere here, anywhere. And then we are now fluctuating around that point. So this is the concept of small signal in PLN. So that's why here when I write F in and F out and whatever signal I put here, then they are all small signals. Of course, F in and F out are frequency. It's just frequency. But this is delta. Okay. So now, for example, this LPF have, has some gain at low frequency, right? Therefore, here I will get the average multiplied by some gain. Okay. So I call it uh, uh, A low pass filter. And VCO, what VCO does, VCO, if you have an input signal, it will multiply it by some value, which is called the coefficient, frequency coefficient of VCO, KVCO, and then at the output, you will get the frequency. In fact, omega, which is output, into input voltage. So input voltage actually what happens is, if your input voltage, suppose, is some uh, zero, okay, then it will have free running frequency, and then above zero frequency will increase, below zero it will reduce. Therefore, it has something, some characteristics like this. So this is V in VCO, this is output. So, here, for example, will be, we call it free running frequency, you can call it center frequency. And then by increasing the V in, omega will increase. By reducing V in, omega will decrease. And this V in is a small signal. Yes. Practically, you may have a DC voltage here, and then you will fluctuate about that DC. So this is a small signal. And this is, of course, here it reaches to zero, but practically, effectively, we have a range. So this is called operating range or tuning range of VCO. Therefore, this will be in small signal domain will be something. So V in is a small signal. Okay, so then what I will do now, I want to look at frequency. Okay, fine. And then I'm looking at the uh, small signal mode. And this is the loop. So I consider total loop gain to be some value called K. Okay, one is gain of this low pass filter. This frequency detector may have some gain and VCO. So total combined will have gain of K. Therefore, I can write, and what is this? This is my error signal, right, at the end. F out, F in, right? And feedback factor is 1. So, 
what will be the error which actually gives me the an idea of what will be the final frequency I will get. So I will just and consider this low pass filter is just a simple one pole low pass filter lossy filter. Okay. So therefore it will be one upon one plus feedback factor beta s into loop gain, right? Total open loop gain. I call it G S. Feedback factor is 1 and GS is total loop gain, right? And I consider I have just a single pole here and K is total gain at loop gain. Yes? E is error here. F in minus F out. No, no, input is F in, input frequency. Uh, why is not linear? Because X would actually is quite linear. No, the reason is because it's not actually fully linear. It has four operating regions. This why it's linear. If it was completely linear, yes, then actually both would both be same. Okay, so then this is my simple. Now suppose I change my frequency, right? And then suppose I change it by some delta value. Therefore, input frequency is some just I can call it F0. So notice this is a small signal model. When I say F E means delta F E. Okay. I am in a particular locked condition. Frequency was some capital F E and now I apply a small change. Therefore this is a step function. Now I want to see what will be the final frequency, right? Whether so large signal F out large signal was some F in large signal plus something, okay, at the beginning. We don't care. Anyway, it was low. I want to see what will happen. And then effectively what will be final error I will get. So, if I apply some change in the input frequency, which is F0, this will be my input. So, therefore, error function will be F0 upon S into 1 plus K. 1 plus s upon t. Oh, yes. All together. Multiplied and just k. Total. Okay. So now I just write e s. e of s will be equal to so I can write it, if you write it, you will see it will be like this, F0 upon 1 plus K upon S plus K, P into 1 plus K square, 1 plus S into P, 1 upon plus K. So this will be yes. What does it mean means? In the time domain, in fact, not time domain, frequency domain. You know, actually, it's very interesting. What I mean, frequency domain, I, I mean that frequency as a value. Okay. So, in frequency, what does it mean? Means that now my frequency will be F0 upon 1 plus K 2T. Okay. If at time equal to 0, I have changed. Okay. This is frequency. Okay. Your frequency changes versus time in this fashion, right? Means that it jumps to this value. Okay? And this is actually the delta F, small signal frequency. Okay? Plus. And this there will be some constant, which is this P into 1 plus K square. And here you will have that P minus uh, T, P into 1 plus K, right? 
beauty. So this then will vanish after some time. Finally, what I will get is, means that if I change my frequency by some delta value, at the output I will get same change divided by 1 plus k. Right? Yes? Yes. Oh, yeah, of course. That's why this is just a simple analysis. Yeah, yeah, we are neglecting, right? We just consider the year fast enough. Right? Local center essentially is determines the dominant pole of the system. Okay, so then what does it mean? It means that I will have some error, right? And this error, in fact, this is E2. Okay, so this means that this error will be this value. Therefore, what does it mean? It means that F in minus F out will be equal to F0, 1 upon K at CDS. Therefore, output frequency won't be now equal to input frequency, right? There is an error here. So, if I use frequency detector, I won't be able to make these two frequency to be equal. And there will be always an error. And that error is proportional to my log gain, low frequency log gain. So, there is a solution for that. The same thing we do in our pumps. What we do, we use a very high gain. Right? Therefore, we can reduce error to a very small value. That's why input differential voltage of our pump is very low. Therefore, the one solution will be to increase K. Okay? Therefore, input frequency and output frequency can approach each other. But the point is, even if you do this, still, because of non-idealities, you will have offset, right? I told you, look at phase detector as a differential amplifier. It has its own offset, right? And that offset is delta L. So, even if we make even k infinite, because of offset and non, other non-idealities, we may not be able to get the right input frequency. Therefore, even in log condition, if we use frequency detection, we won't be able to get it done. Now, just you change this to phase detection. Therefore, for phase detection, what happens is, your log k will have 1 upon s again, right? So, here... This is for frequency detection case. Now, if you repeat this for phase detection, for phase detection, you will have this. Same thing, your ES error will be, now, your error will be here. Here we had this error. Now, because now this is a phase detector. And input is frequency, therefore, phase detector now will have a transfer function of 1 upon s. Okay? Therefore, the only change now will be, instead of having this, I will have f0 upon s square. Fine? Now, again, you get value of Essentially, yes. So, this was yes upon B in, right? F in S. Square distribution. Yes upon F in was this. Okay, yeah. Then it will be. No, this will be F0 upon S square. Because F0 upon S is already there, I multiply it by 1 upon S. And there will be here also. So this will be here. And this is 1. 
This is loop gain. This is input one upon this. Correct? It will be 1 plus Gs which is this, F is 1 and 1 upon S which is because of S detector. Then I have this input F0 upon S. So now this will be the new term. Now you calculate this, okay. So then I don't write the remaining part. The finally what you will get from here. So therefore, really at the steady state now, you will have a zero. Means that really input phase and output phase will be same. If I use, the main point is because here I have an integrator. If you remember, in feedback system with integrator, steady state there are approaches to zero. This is exactly because of that point. And even intuitively, what will happen in a uh, system with phase detector. Suppose if these two frequencies are not same exactly, right? There is an error at the CDS. But then output of phase detector will increase with time, right? And therefore input of VCO will increase and therefore this frequency will increase. Means that it cannot be stable at the CDS with error which is not zero. And even if there is offset or there is anything else to two null and non idealities, that offset also will appear as a signal because that also is a part of signal and then we are integrating that error. That error can be to do anything. It can be offset, it can be uh, difference between input frequency and output frequency, whatever it is. But that error is getting integrated. And because it is integrated, therefore, if that error is not zero, then it will accumulate, right? You are accumulating that error. And it will again try to change the frequency to reduce the error. Because system is a feedback system, negative feedback. So putting an integrator is integrating from, integrating all errors. Which is in fact this error, yes. And therefore we will get the stable uh, steady state frequency, which is equal to input frequency, considering input signal is periodic. So this is the main reason phase detector is required so that you can exactly match input and output frequency. And it is very important because if you match them, then it, it simply you can generate any frequency out of it. You just put a frequency divider here. Therefore, at the output, you will get input frequency, output of frequency divider. And at the input of frequency divider, you will get n times of that frequency. And this is what is done actually for multiplying frequency. Oh yes, it's possible. We will see. For example, uh, XOR has just one output and that output is not a function of a phase. Now if I make a logic circuit which can detect uh, rise and fall edges and give me some information by making two outputs. Like, for example, two bits. Then I would be able to have frequency and phase both. And that is actually important because then I can have two signals and uh, according to the difference between frequency of input and output, if input frequency is higher than output frequency, one of them will uh, show more uh, pulses. We will see. We will reach to that. It is actually a two-bit or two-signal circuit as a um, modification to XOR, which can detect frequency. Actually, frequency detector is required. Because here we assume phase is completely locked. You know, we are in a lock condition or bias condition in just normal language, not professional language. We are in a bias condition or lock condition. Loop is locked. 
و جس یا هرتار بین دات لوب بات سپوز اف ایت از توتالی انلاکت انلاکت این سنس دات یو هاف ا فریکوینسی اند انی وی دس کان نات هاف ان انفینایت رینج یو کان نات امپلای انی فریکوینسی اند اکسپکت ایت شود ورک فرست اف اول اسپید اف دس کمپوننتس از امپورتنت تیونینگ رینج اف ویس یو از فیکس رایت یو کان نات اکسپکت انی فریکوینسی فرام ویس یو دیرفور سپوز اف یو اپلای ا سیگنال سی ا فریکوینسی اف سی One gigahertz, but this you cannot give more than 100 megahertz. Therefore, it is impossible this loop to lock, for this loop to lock. Now, sometimes it even happens that at the beginning, to, for this loop to settle, it will take a long time to finally, even if everything is okay. But if, if I can detect frequency right from the beginning and help the loop, because if I can detect at the beginning, these two frequencies are far from each other. So if I can detect frequency, then I can give a very high signal so that it will increase frequency, bring it to the level that I can, and then try to adjust phase now. So it is important to have this uh, also in mind because this loop should remain in a lock condition, and if it is, if if it goes away from lock condition, it should come back quickly to the lock condition. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is very space. We have that. Hmm. Directly. In fact, there is a circuit which can actually detect both. Let's see. Okay. Okay, so this is in fact a repeat of what I can, um, talked about. Of course, see, there are different things also. One is whether your signal is logic, I mean, digital or analog. For example, do you have a sine wave or do you have a square wave? For example, in logic, it's very easier almost to detect frequency. But in analog, also there are circuits that you can detect the frequency. What you mean is that I have a single frequency, right, at the input. So, see, the whole point is that I have a single frequency. It means that my frequency uh, signal is periodic. Okay, or at least if it is not periodic, for some duration of time, I can assume it's periodic. And then looking at this duration, then I consider it is completely with a constant frequency. Now, if frequency is constant, then I can detect zero crossing points, right? And if I detect zero crossing points, actually I have detected the frequency, right? And convert those zero crossing points into a voltage, similar manner. For example, getting average. So what is important for frequency detection is we should be able to detect zero crossing points. In digital, how do we do it? We actually detect rise and fall. That is the same point. In analog, we detect zero crossing if we have a sine wave. Then it goes from negative to positive and vice versa. So this is a convention.